everyone, and welcome to the Training Ground Podcast with your host, Kevin Barry. In this episode, Kevin is speaking with Julian Sisman. Julian is the owner of Prepare for Performance, a private training facility located in Maryland. Julian works predominantly with soccer athletes and is a former Division I soccer player. Today, Kevin and Julian will be discussing problems with the current format of U.S. Youth Soccer Leagues, his advice to youth players who want to play in college, his thoughts on the beep test for soccer, how to plan a training week, and the most common soccer training mistakes and how to fix them. I, I was looking up your um, some of your stuff that you have online, just as your name and, and whatnot. Um, did you go to Ohio State or did you transfer there for soccer? Or can we get into that story a little bit? Yeah, so... My story is kind of crazy. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> if you people listen to this, they're gonna be like, "Yo, this guy's a shit show." Yeah. But, um, no, I, I'm. I, that's uh, exactly what we're looking for. I'm, I'm a very transparent person, so I'm gonna be honest. Um, so, really, how it all happened was, um, you know, honestly, through high school, like my goal was always to be a pro. Um, mm-hmm. I'm always. I mean, I've been like close to, you know, I've always been playing at a high level, like very high level Um, in Maryland. uh, You know, it's not really a big deal now with uh, ODP and, you know, playing, um, you know, back when I was playing club soccer, it's it's all very different than it is now. Um, You know, it was uh, the, the team's, the leagues, all that kind of stuff. It was like very small. It's not as big now where there's like a million leagues and, you know, I have this conversation all the time. Um, so like it was close, it was, it wasn't so, uh, like there was like one league and everybody in that league, if you were in like one division, like your team was sick, like you guys were good. Like it was very good, good competition. And then when he got to ODP, which is like the, state team um when i was growing up like if you're on odp like you know you're a top player in in the, in the state um no doubt um and i was playing again and i was playing with kids that there's probably a couple maybe a handful still playing pro or you know still trying to navigate it but probably some of them are out of it because you know we're we should be around most of us are like 32, 33 years old anyways. But I'll say that most of those kids um, all play D1, I would say. D1 soccer at very prominent universities. So we're talking like Maryland, you know, um, Loyola, Maryland. Uh, yeah, some like big name colleges. But for me, you know, I was, I was set on like trying to be a pro, but – it is what it is. The journey started and, um, you know, probably didn't do my best in high school as far as like school. Um, didn't, you know, so I went to community college. I didn't play the first year in community college, but I played the second year in community college. I did really well, had a lot of goals, had a lot of assists, like probably was, Sec, I mean, but at that time, like MC, which is what it was, um, you know, wasn't division one, like it is now for Juco. Um, we're playing like D three. So it was like, whoever shows up, tries out, like, you know, they, that's the team that's going to be there. Um, but we were like really, really good. Like we had some really good players. Um, I'm sure none of them are playing right now, but anyways, um, did really well. I went to a try. I went to a tournament with like a, like a club soccer team. Um, cause I was still like at age to play U19. So we went to a U19 tournament in Arizona and similar to what they do now is like, I just reached out to all the, all the universities that were going to be there. I said, Hey, I'm going to be a here. I'm going to be on this field. You know, I'm interested in playing soccer at whatever level, at whatever, I don't even remember how many schools it was. So I, you know, got there, played, played one game where I assisted maybe twice 
and scored maybe once. And um, the Ohio State assistant coach at the time, like, came up to me. I was like, hey, uh, um, you know, this is my car. Please contact me. And please also, he gave me his car to give it to another player on the team who actually ended up going there that fall. Um, so st- still um, had to wait like another year. So then I went the following year um, and transferred there from MC and um, did, did okay. I mean, I will tell, I tell this to kids all the time. It's, um, you know, going from club soccer in, in this country to playing D one soccer. It's like, like you gotta, you can't just say like, Oh, you know, like I'm ready. It's a totally different level. Like it's like two notches above like club soccer. And I, I can't even imagine, you know, the MLS here. Cause it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went there, you know, long story short, I went there, um, did well first year and, you know, I really wasn't, um, happy. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm, I don't really care like to say this, uh, I really wasn't happy with the coaching. Um, cause I was, you know, one of the most fit kids on the team. Um, you know, and basically I just decided to transfer and really wasn't, I, and really wasn't interested in getting an economics degree, to be honest with you, because that was all I could do at that moment. So I just transferred to AU, which is American University, and because I got into the business school there, mm-hmm. and basically just finished school and dabbled around with some pro stuff then. So I was like, very, you know, I had time to like do do like trials and things like that, and. You know, I went over overseas to Turkey because that's like uh, that's like my background. Um, you know, did some trials. But I got injured, so basically, after I did that in like 2000 and what, 12 or 13, I just kind of like said, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, so. no, that's an interesting story. Um, I won't mind just getting into it now. Um, I think it seems like you almost missed the kind of explosion in soccer in Maryland by, you know, three or five years or so. If you look at it now, um, it seems in a completely different place as, as an outsider. Um, would you agree with that? Or how do you see the progression in the state? What do you mean by explosion? Um, I was looking at the, now there's NPSL teams. Um, I know there's uh, the development academy teams, though they're just changing names. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have Bethesda there, you know, DC United is not too far away. Mm -hmm. Um, Baltimore um, has a a armor. They Mm -hmm. have their development academy team. And, you know, I know some of those teams weren't there at the time, but is that affecting the talent at the same time? Like you said, there's too many teams now and too many leagues that maybe kids aren't having competition every week. Well, I mean, um, to be honest, I don't think... uh, most of those teams were, were there back in the day. Um, okay. So it's just more or less of a change or a, uh, like combining teams that were in like a certain area. Um, for instance, like Maryland United, I think it used to be two different club teams called, I think it was like free state and like Bowie. I think they just combined it and decided to call themselves Maryland United. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure that, for instance, like Baltimore Armor, you know, they were basically like SAC, which is Columbia Soccer Club. And then I think they, um, th- that was created. So, uh, which is, it is what it is. I mean, um, I don't know why they didn't, I think it was, I think it was more or less cause they started, they used like all the club teams like in the area. So back in the day when there was just SAC and then in, in Baltimore, it was like Casimir Bays. Um, and, uh, this other club called BFC, which was Baltimore football club. 
And I, I could be wrong. I could, so there was like two teams in Baltimore and now they're like two or three teams. Um, and so they like feed players into armor and mm-hmm. no, it's just all, it's, honestly, it's like a shit show to be honest with you. Um, it, it's, it's too, there's to me, um, the biggest issue with soccer is there's too many leagues. Um, so it's like too sad, like too many leagues. So like, instead of like bringing all the best players into like one league in this area and just like having like coaches come watch this league, like people are all over the place. So you can't find kids, like kids fall through the cracks, you know, you know, if like there's a really good kid on one team and you know, uh, the other players, you know, aren't that great. It's, it's just hard to like find this player or whatever. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, like there's not a lot of difference in the teams. Um, it's just like, there's too many leagues and there needs to be less leagues and just like have one league with all these teams in it. And just like, so like, for instance, like coaches in college or pro or whatever can just go to like this game versus like all these other games, all these other leagues. Like, what is this? What is that? Like, how's the, how's the competition in this league versus this league? Like, it's such a, it's such a, it's not that good. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You no, know, like when I was growing up, there was one league NCSL, that was it. And that was like a league. Mm-hmm. And, and, but you know, everybody wants a piece of the pie. So that's why there's so many leagues. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with that hundred percent because I've seen from the recruiting aspect for um, women's soccer division two here at my current um, position in division one previously that, like you said, coaches are struggling to determine what's the best tournament to go to even, mm-hmm. you know, so should they go to North Carolina or should they go to Maryland or should they go somewhere else? And it's really difficult. Um, like, like you said, division one, two, and three, even in the same league, division one doesn't mean the best anymore. So it can be tough to, to find a, yeah, I mean, to find recruits. You look at, you look at like EDP and they have like, I don't even know. Like they have so many like names for God only knows what. Then you have ECNL. I don't even know. Um, Cause like ECNL is boys and girls now. Uh, EDP is, I believe it's boys and girls. Then you still have NCSL, which no one really does anymore unless you're like a third tier team in like a club. So it, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not good. It's not yeah. good for soccer. Um, cause it's just the developmental standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. What do you see is kind of the downfall of ODP? Um, just like a quick backstory. When I was getting into refereeing in Maryland, um, we were doing local games and kind of regional games. And then there was an ODP tournament and we were told, you know, if you referee this tournament, you're going to be in a really good spot. And we went there and the quality was just, it was really poor. Um, and I know in the past that has been a really good standard. And like you said, when, when you played, you know, it meant something. Um, do you, what do you see is the downfall there? Is it money or just saturated um, talent or? So what the, the problem is literally Academy. So, you know, instead of playing for your state team, you're going to go play for, you want to go, you, if you want to go play for like the best club or whatever, you're going to go play Academy. Um, and so like, if you play on Academy, you can't really do anything else. They focus on, you know, that's it. So you can't play ODP, you can't play high school, you know, you can't, you know, go play for another team. Maybe they double card you for like a, like a different league or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you're not playing a lot of Academy games. Um, but that's really it. Like, I, like 2006, when I graduated high school is when like a year, like a, like a year or so later, or like around that same time, this was when Academy started to like, Process, like started to take place mm-hmm. so that from that year on it's just it, ODP is it's like a it's like a back burner for kids um, you know if you're not on academy you're going to be on ODP um, even though the level is not that great I mean having that on your resume is better than nothing because you know college coaches probably still think it's great 
but to me, it's probably not that great because you're not going to get seen. You know what I mean? I mean, when I was in, when I was playing on ODP, they had a tournament uh, in Rhode Island every year. It's like the ODP. It's like a regional tournament. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's where the college coaches were. They were, they, they literally, they would literally, I mean, they might still do this. Um, they literally lock, they, they block off like the middle of the, like, so they have fields back to back. It's just like, boom, boom, boom. The middle strip of the fields is typically where all the college coaches are. And they would, they would literally rope it off. So no, no, like parents would go down there or, you know, all the stuff. So if you're in that tournament, like you're probably going to get seen, you're probably going to get recruited. I'm sure multiple times from that tournament, I was recruited um, to some D3 schools. Mm -hmm. I was recruited in D3, but you know, I didn't want to play D3. Um, I mean, you know, like I said, I was fortunate to play D1. I, um, you know, I understand like, it's great to know the level because you're able to like kind of uh, pass it down to kids and get them to understand that it's like, you know, it's a job that you have to be focusing on for year after year after year. It's not just like, you know, I'm just going to roll up and think, you know, this is some easy thing to do. Um, cause you know, playing D1 it's, it's a totally different it's totally different it's a year round thing it's not like D2 or D3 where you just have a season and you know you're basically not going to meet again so maybe in the spring if you have a spring season D1 it's like you have the fall you got like a little break you have like a winter training where it's you know so many hours a, a week um, so it's like it's a year round process or year round program. I mean, it's not anything to mess with cause you're, you're going to have a spring season. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. cause that's really like where the coaches are going to be like, all right, who are we cutting or who are we not going to bring back or who are we going to let go? You know? So there's a lot of determination from that spring season for the fall. Um, some kids are trying out for walk-ons. So you might have somebody that just like in the, school that's like yo I want to try out and see what happens so there's a lot of things um but you know kind of go back to your question I mean I'm gonna be honest with you academy kind of ruined it yeah that, yeah that has been something I've heard from a couple of different people now um taking it back a step when you were at Ohio State you did mention that you know your fitness was really good was that something that during that time frame that initially you got into, you know, strength and conditioning or personal training or just trying to make the most of your opportunity and kind of building that into your passion for training and players today? Yeah, um, definitely was. Uh, I would say that was um, another, you know, you know, at that time, like – even, even when I was in high school, um, I was very fit. Like, like even when I was in middle school, like, you know, I'll never forget my middle school teacher, like PE teacher were doing tryouts. And I'm like, you know, he, he wanted to see everyone's endurance, but like now I'm like, I would never make kids do a mile run. But anyways, um, but like, even that time, like he was like, you know, I was fit high school. Like I was fit. Um, I was doing, you know, there was a, there was a, um, fitness test that we did. It was called a two in one. So you do two miles and then you rest for six minutes and then you do another mile. And so like you put those, combine those two together to figure out like where you got in three miles. So I, um, you know, I basically was doing like six minute miles. Um, and then when I went to college, when I was playing at Ohio State, like that whole summer, you know, I got the fitness pack in, I got the, all that stuff. And I was just like crushing it. I was like, I'm determined to go there and, you know, be the one of the top fittest. And when we did the two mile run that we did the test on, it was like the two, the fastest two mile I ever did in my life, which is like 11 minutes five seconds. So, you know, 
I was, you know, I was fit for sure. I think, you know, one thing that when I look back on that and I look back on, you know, all the education and training and all the things that I've gone through since, there's probably a f- some things I would definitely change um, as far as like fitness goes. So, yeah, I've thought about that myself recently um, because this summer is 10 years out for me from my freshman year at college. And I see, you know, a lot of coaches online will post their 10 tips in 10 years and whatnot. But um, same story as you, Julian. For me, I got the summer packet. It was actually mailed to me to Ireland. And I, it was 12 weeks and I thought of it as, you know, don't let fitness be the reason why you're going to make a bad first impression. You know, that's something you do have full control in and kind of Mm -hmm. took it from there. Um, Mm -hmm. So once you did finish up at college, I know you said you were playing a little bit too. Did you ever consider getting into soccer coaching itself or were you more drawn towards um, personal training or strength conditioning aspect? No, I did. Um, So, I mean, I still coach today. Um, so I was doing some club soccer here and there. I was doing like, like rec soccer here and there, um, you know, just to like, you know, get myself out there in front of people. Um, so I coached a club team like, like here it's called MSI, MSC Academy back then. Um, I did that. I coached high school. I did that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, it was a way for me to get my name out there cause I was doing like strength conditioning and coaching at the same time. Um, so it was like one of those things. Um, it was, and you know, it's necessary, especially for, um, if you want to work with athletes, I think it's important because you understand, you, you see the game, you get an idea of like what these kids need. Um, which helps you with your, you know, your work. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, you st- I still like, like the game. So it's not like I'm going to sit there and just to, like totally rem- remove myself. Um, so I, um, and now I decided to, well, this fall I didn't, but now I decided to go back and coach my, my high school. Mm -hmm. we'll see like next fall if it happens i don't know um but yeah i mean definitely uh you know i was doing like one-on-one soccer coaching i was doing you know teams i was assist coaching um so definitely get myself involved yeah no i'm a similar situation to yourself um there's not a whole lot of avenues to continue playing when you graduate college unless you're going like you said you know professional or you're going mls or now there is usl for some people um so i i got into refereeing and that was like you said to stay involved you know at the end of the day uh what are some of the common mistakes you see kids making um as far as their training goes or preparation. I know you you wrote a great post recently. I'd like to kind of expand on that where you had um, five tips to boost performance before you stepped in the gym. Uh, But there's a lot of info out there now online, you know, more than ever. Um, But some kids, they aren't training any better than, you know, we might've been five, 10, 15 years ago. So what are some mistakes people are making? Um, So I think the first one is, um, the type of fitness that they're doing. Um, uh, so what, what do I mean by fitness? I mean by like strength, like, you know, conditioning training. So the reason I think it's number one is because a lot of coaches still focus on these like long distance runs, um, and, you know, trying to boost, or trying to increase their, you know, aerobic capacity, which is fine. Like, don't get me wrong. You need that. Like it helps with recovery, um, things like that, but it's too much. Like you don't need like three, four days a week of like running, uh, uh, like long distance, or you don't need, sometimes you have coaches that are, um, basically like 
don't even give kids like recovery days after like a weekend game, two or three games, and then they'll go and do more fitness midweek or in the middle of the week. So like, I think one of the biggest things is either they're too much running preseason as far as like long distance running, focusing on like two mile runs, like, um, and things like that. Or, you know, these 400s or whatever, 600s or 800s and things like that. Um, And, you know, I got um, a lot of information from somebody. I don't even know how I came across it. It was like a long time ago. Uh, His name is Charlie Francis. He was like an Olympic, um, uh, you know, sprint trainer or uh, Olympic trainer from Canada a long time ago. And um, he talked about like the high low, um, you know, off season training, if you want to call it that. And, um, you can still incorporate the low intensity days, even in season, um, as like recovery days, but his low intensity days were these like one hundreds that he would just like, like accumulate per week. So I tried it out myself where I would do like hundreds, um, you know, running at like a 15 second pace across around down the field, like, like you know, do like 10, couple times a week then increase it maybe like one or two a week. And then over time, like you're going to accumulate, you know, whatever, uh, the, the distance, like, uh, up to like maybe 4,000, 5,000, um, meters. And so I was really fit. I wasn't running like hunt, like miles around the track. I was just running the field. And I tried this with some some kids and it really was beneficial for them because one, it wasn't as, you know, there's not a lot of like, you know, fatigue, accumulated fatigue. And plus there's not a lot of like wear and tear from just like running, you know, all this time. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Second is a lot of kids don't strain training, period. They just, they just focus on running and soccer. Um, and I mean, I could, you know, pull together a million like research papers stating the benefits of strength training, you know, even if it's once a week. Um, so, you know, there's still a, uh, you know, conversation of, oh, it's not good for kids because, you know, it's going to stunt their growth or it's going to do this or it's going to do that from parents when there's plenty of research even making statements that, like, it has no effect on that. Um, I think another thing for kids is they just don't get enough sleep. Uh, That's, like... And they and they want to, you know, have... They want to do this, like, oh, well... They always have the question of like, how do I boost my, you know, performance? I'm like, all right, well, what are you doing? Like outside of training, outside of, you know, this and this. And I, and I have a conversation. I'm like, what are you, how, how many hours, hours are you sleeping a night? Oh, maybe like four or five, maybe six. Um, so that's another one. Um, I think the, the four, a good fourth one is, you know, what are they eating? Um, a lot of these kids don't even eat enough food. You know, I get kids coming to training and and their first meal was 12 o'clock. I'm like, dude, and they haven't. And so like a first meal at 12 and they've trained at two and like they're literally working on fumes because basically the energy that they're using for the session is basically what they ate yesterday. It's not what they just ate. Um, and, and that's just something that a lot of these kids don't understand. Or even if they have breakfast, they might be working on that at, you know, the three, four o'clock time. Um, so a lot of kids don't eat properly. Um, I have a, I mean, I'm not trying to like put myself out there, but like I have a podcast episode on eating um, with this lady that, um, I, um, am good friends with, um, it's probably like the most played one for 
Uh, it's on nutrition. You, that's that's <laughs> awesome. We're going to link that because for me, um, I'm 11 episodes in now, and we're actually looking to speak to somebody in uh, that's a dietitian or a nutritionist. So yeah, so that'd be great. I can definitely connect you with her. Um, so that's number four and number five. I think um, it's a, it's a lot of it's mental. There's a there's a mental piece that. Um, a lot of kids, parents, coaches, um, you know, don't address. Um, I know it sounds crazy because you're like, what do you mean mental? Um, you know, people that are listening to this, it's it's not like, oh, it's mental as in like, how's your attitude? How's your thoughts around, you know, performance? How's your thoughts around, you know, the game? Like, are you mentally preparing yourself for the game? Are you mentally preparing yourself for, you know, whatever session that you're about to, you know, you know, partake in? Because um, I think a lot of kids, you know, unless they get some type of training or, you know, have somebody that explains it to them, um, you know, just roll up to training and just, it is what it is. And then leave versus like focusing on, all right, today, you know, kind of thinking about the last session or last game, you know, what do, what do I need to work on from the last game? Like, am I, is my left foot garbage? Or is my right foot bad? Uh, how are my sprints? How are my, how's my intensity at practice? How's my attitude for practice? Like there's things that you have to think about that will help you perform better. And when you, and when you are able to do that and you're able to compound that over time, you know, your session your personal session or your training will get better. Your game, your preparedness for the game will be better. Um, you know, if you're working with like a strength coach and you're like, Hey man, like I need to you know, work on my first step or I need to work on my first five yards or I need to work on getting more explosive. Like you'll be able to understand like what's going on and then be able to take that with you. to your next like, training session with a strength coach or a speed coach or whoever you're working with. Cause then you can work on that, even though that's going to take time. It's not going to be overnight, but it's something that you can, you know, get from session um, and work on for your development. Um, and so, you know, I think those are the, you know, four or five things that a lot of kids need to address in order for them to continue to get better, especially if they aspire to, you know, play at D1 or play pro, um, because it's not a, you know, there's no overnight success. I'll be honest with you. There's no, you and I know like half of these pros that we watch on TV, like have gone through, days and months and years of just fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, getting better, working on things they need to get better because they know that that's the only way out. You know, here, some of these kids, it's like, Oh, we go to college and get a job and, you know, live on the same, you know, wheel as everybody else's, you know, everybody else's go to college, get a job and, you know, live our life that way, work up the ladder da, 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 versus like kids that like want to like be the different kid. And, you know, I want to be a pro, like make that statement. Okay. So then you got to work on it. Like you can't just say it and just you know, not work on yourself. Yeah. I think like culturally, it's a little bit different. I kind of have a unique perspective in like where I grew up, you know, football or soccer was an everyday thing. Um, we, a lot of times we didn't need coaches, you know, we'd get together and be competitive, but now I notice here, a lot of kids don't really live the sport, you know, they don't, um, watch games even, or, you know, they don't stay after practice when possible, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, so that's exactly what I mean. So, you know, it's, it's the, that's the biggest problem here. Um, you know, we have, we, we're in this culture where, and you know, that's why the, you know, in college, for instance, like, 
if you look at the the numbers, the amount of kids that go from high school to a D1 sport, right, is a very low percentage. It's like one to two percent, right? If you did a research paper or something on that and said, what's what are what are the kids doing that are going to the D1 level that the kids that are, you know, maybe the same age and on the same team and not making it there. I bet you some of those kids are doing things that are, are not scheduled. So what do I mean by that? So yes, we have practice Monday through Thursday, but are you going to the gym and just getting a 30 minute lift in? Okay, maybe before practice. Are you showing up to practice early and getting some extra touches in, maybe some working on some things, preparing your stuff for the session? Are you doing and, and you don't need, you know, there, there's so many resources out there now. You don't need like an additional soccer coach to teach you skills that you need to work on. Like just go on YouTube, find things that like might simulate what you're trying to work on and just work on those things. So are the kids, and and, and I'm not saying you have to do this in season. Like, are you doing the things that you need to do in the off season to prepare yourself for the season? Then when it gets to season, you're playing, you're, you're able to play at a high level um, and, 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 and continue to grow. Um, that's why I think a small percentage only make it because the other 99%, it's more of like, I hate to say this, but like, it's more of like mommy and daddy want me to play a sport or I just want to play the sport. Something happens. Great. I'm not going to do extra work. I'm just going to do what's necessary and then, you know, go to college, da, da, da. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of kids need to understand is if you really want it, it can't just be when something is quote unquote scheduled. It has to be the times where you don't feel like training and doing extra training and it's freezing out or it's really hot out and go out and get some extra touches in, work on shooting, work on, you know, whatever could fitness strength work, whatever um, that will make you different because you can't fo- If you want to be, you know, that 1%, you can't follow everybody else. You got to be that guy that's like out there, like doing something that's extraordinary in order to be here versus be average. Absolutely. Yeah. It makes sense. When you were talking about condition, I think we're in a, agreement here where we need to kind of take out those two mile or three mile fitness tests. Um, yeah, that can be a tough sell for a lot of coaches that might be old school. Um, what could we do instead as far as fitness testing goes, or is there even a place for standardized testing anymore? I mean, I think, I think a good fitness test to be honest with you is, is a B test. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but you know, it, it, it incorporates everything that is necessary in the game of soccer. Um, Whatever version you want to do. I mean, I know there's like a, like a ton of them and there's the, there's a beat test, a plate. uh, I forget forget the other ones. Um, Pacer, something like that. I don't, I don't, I don't remember the exact names, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great because you know, at the end of the day, you know, soccer is is a sport where, yes, endurance is necessary. You know, be able to, you know, play 90. Okay, don't get me wrong. Um, but I don't see any soccer player unless you're like a nut job and don't understand the game and just running around like a chicken with its head cut off. There's no player in, you know, even at the highest level that's running around for two miles nonstop. So I think, you know, and, and, and there's so many coaches, high level strength coaches playing at D one. And I've seen their training p- programs. Yeah. They incorporate long distance running. But if you look at majority of their, you know, 
program. It's a lot of sprint work. So whatever distance, tens, twenties, thirties, um, working on high intensity runs, working on, you know, quote unquote shuttle runs, um, things like that. Um, and, and those, those, that's what's, that's the game. Um, and you know, maybe two or three weeks of some type of long distance running, but I don't think after that, like you should be good because at the end of the day, I think a lot of the coaches should be able to incorporate the low intensity uh, training into their practice. So they don't even have to worry about that as an extra for, for, for like fitness. Um, because like, you know, you're doing your ball work, your heart rate is going to be at a certain intensity. If you're, you know, if it's, if you're uh, doing it for some sort of time, you know, practice, if you're doing eight V eights, four V fours, whatever, like the, the, like you can get fitness there. So you don't need to add fitness unless it's a player that is off to the side, can't do contact, needs to do extra sprints to keep the uh, high intensity runs. Okay. I get it. But like doing additional fitness, especially in season, like, like Manchester's or full field sprints or this or that, I, I personally think is so unnecessary. Um, and you should, if you're a good coach, uh, especially these coaches that have their quote unquote, a licenses or B licenses, and you're incorporate continue to incorporate more and more fitness. It's just going to harm the player and fatigue the player and they're not going to recover and they're going to go into games sluggish. And then you're going to wonder why, because they're not recovering from the session that you had like two or three days ago because you're doing all this unnecessary training where like we are focusing on a game here, the soccer, like play the game, get the fitness in the game, bring the energy to the practice because the, if you bring the energy, the players will bring the energy when they have that energy, they'll play hard during practice. If you don't bring the energy and you come in like sluggish and not feeling like you care about the session, and that's what that's the energy that your players are going to get you in return. So it's one of those things where you know it's it's only, I think it's only necessary if it's in season. Uh, I mean off season. Sorry, um, and other times of the year, just focus on some sort of sprints if it's for distance, um, and it should only be used for players that may not be getting a lot of minutes coming back from injury, but all the other players that are playing, you know, 60 plus minutes, like probably don't need extra fit fitness. Love it. Oh, great perspective. Uh, last question for you, Julian. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about your own business prepare for performance and then uh, your podcast as well and kind of how you developed that in the past couple of years? So, you know, <laughs> I know it sounds cheesy, but I literally came up with the name, like, because, you know, like, literally, you have to prepare <laughs> for performance, literally. Like, I know it sounds stupid, but like... It's an easy sell. <laughs> I it, love it. It. Like, it. It's literally, like, it explains itself in the words. Um, you know, and that's the thing, like... I, I, I sat down for like months prior to like even, you know, incorporating it and all that kind of stuff. Um, just thinking about like, what should I name this? Like, what is something that like I can tie everything that I do and believe in and my philosophies and, and all that kind of stuff. And I just one day just like put it all together. Um, you know, it was, you know, it was like I said, it was like a couple months. So, you know, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, you know, every, in every sport, it doesn't really matter what you do. You have to prepare if you want to play at a high level. Um, and, and then, you know, that's sort of like why I, I, I decided to name it that it's just because, um, and, 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 and even life. Cause like I work not only with athletes, I work with, 
uh, you know, adult population, people that are like 35 plus. And we always had these, you know, you know, talks and conversations about, you know, even if you're a business professional, you have to prepare for work, for presentations, for whatever. Um, if it's, you know, preparing physically, mentally, um, you know, preparing, you know, writing out your documents or whatever you need, um, you know, going through the documents, preparing for the, the presentation. So everything, um, that we do in life, if you want to succeed and we've seen this over and over again, you got to prepare for, you know, that, that, situation performance if it's you know athletics or if it's your performance for you know work or however you want to call it um but so anyways to so basically i i work with kids that are really 10 i mean individuals that are 10 to i mean 60s um you know if it's an athlete majority of my athletes right now are are soccer players um you know, we focus on my philosophy is a lot on, you know, um, you know, I want to prepare you for the game. So incorporating all aspects. So incorporating, you know, some sort of, um, jump training, speed agility training, um, strength, fitness, if necessary. Um, you know, if you're in off season, you know, we're going to do some type of fitness. If you're in season, typically I just address the needs of the athletes, fill their buckets for what they need um, at that time. So a lot of the conversation when kids come in, because everybody's in a different place, is like, like, um, you know, if I have a college kid in off season, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, the training program might be very similar to some other kids, but you know, the template might be the same, but there's different, you know, variables that I'm working with. So like sets, reps and all that kind of stuff is different than like a kid that might be in high school or club and is here in Maryland and he's in season. Like I'm gonna, so everybody is, um, in it, the training program is very individualized. Um, cause I'm always having conversations with the kids when they come in. I'm like, so how are you feeling? Uh, if they're feeling like, you know, out of a 10, like they're feeling like a six or five or six, you know, we might just focus on strength, no speed and agility and that's it. And they're out the door. If it's like a kid, he's fresh, he's ready. You know, we're going to go hard. Um, so it's very, it's very individualized. Um, even though, you know, I kind of pre-program a lot of programming, I'll change some things up on the fly if necessary. Um, just to make sure that, you know, like I said, like I'm giving these kids what they, what they need. Um, and then when it comes to like the adult population, you know, we just try to like fit in some type of strength work, get them stronger, you know, build their confidence, lose weight, you know, get into clothes that they want to get into that they've never gone into or have gone into in years. Um, and try to have fun with it on that end because I don't like to make it boring for them. So, um, for the kids, it's a little bit different cause they like just want to work out and like leave. <laughs> yeah. So, um, then as far as my podcast goes, um, really it started off more of like, I was just trying to, I don't really like writing. So I was just trying to like, um, basically take my thoughts and like create them into videos and just put it on like as a podcast. Um, and then I got more into like, you know, kind of what we're doing here is just like reaching out to different people in different fields, um, as far it, different parts of the fitness industry. So like nutrition, um, professors, you know, different, you know, areas of the fitness industry and just try to provide information to, um, to people, the right information, um, and make sure that they, 
you know, we, we cross about, we cross different topics, but, um, just to make sure that, you know, whatever they see online is either if it's right or wrong, you know, just making sure we're providing like good, you know, evidence-based content, um, even, you know, practical content too. So like Absolutely. immediately. So yeah. that's kind of like the gist of it. Awesome. No, that's great. I think I was talking to somebody yesterday and I said, we're basically the filter in the fitness industry, you know, where, cause there is a lot of content that is easy to put out there, but you don't know, you know, is there any evidence behind it or mm-hmm. are you going to get results from it? So mm-hmm. great perspective. Yeah. yeah. I appreciate you coming on today. I know topics were wide varying, but this has been great. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome, man. I um, appreciate you, you know, inviting me on here hope you enjoyed this episode with julian it's one of my favorite episodes so far uh, we continued a lot of the conversation off mic or off air i used to live close to where julian's facility is and refereed a lot of high school college and club soccer around there um, so it was nice to see it from another perspective julian also has his own podcast called train to perform which can be found on all podcast platforms and his instagram account is prepare for performance and website is also the same name so prepare for a performance.com if you enjoyed this episode please share with others appreciate you guys thank you